Okay. I um, want to thank you all for joining us this evening. We, we have the pleasure of hearing from Dr. Philip Brown. He's an ass assistant professor at Virginia Tech School of Plant and Environmental Sciences. He has a 100% extension appointment, I believe, looking at the, uh, the appropriate use, upkeep, and installation of septic systems. And uh, this is actually the first opportunity I've had to, to meet uh, Dr. Brown. I've, I've seen his publications, um, and, and I think uh, when he speaks, you'll, you'll see that he's got an accent from somewhere east of uh, Roanoke. And so I so appreciate him joining us this evening and um, enlightening us. Uh, uh, the topic is going to be keeping your septic system functioning well uh, during the pandemic, which I think is something with all of us being at home more than we were. I think this is something that's very timely and is going to be very useful for us. So, uh, so thank you very much, Dr. Brown, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. I'm going to try and share my screen. I should be good at this by now, I thought. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Okay, yeah. Um, I am Philip Brown. I'm an extension specialist in soil science and septic system education um, at, in the School of Plant and Environmental Sciences at Virginia Tech. And we're going to talk about keeping your septic system healthy during a pandemic today. Um, before we get started, a little background, because I do have a, a rather peculiar accent. It's, uh, it's South, from South Carolina. Originally, originally, I'm actually from Yorkshire in England. Um, but during my undergraduate degree, I got the chance to come over to the US and work at Clemson University in South Carolina. So I spent a year there and then I came back and I did a master's. Then I followed it up with a PhD and some postdoc work. And in the meantime, I went back to the UK for a short while and worked at an agricultural college lecturing on soils and agriculture. Um, then once I was complete, once I'd completed it, um, I was looking for jobs and I was very lucky to get this position at Virginia Tech, which is kind of suits exactly what I do. I, most of my research has been in soil physics. So I look at um, water movement through soils is mostly what I've spent most of my time looking at. And uh, I got employed, I think the 10th of January last year. So I've been in this position for a whole year and it's been a very entertaining year. Um, basically, I was here for two months going in and out of work and it was, it was really good. It's my, I was kind of enjoying the job, it was a lot of fun. And then about two months in, everything just shut down. And since then I've pretty much been here, which is my basement. And it looks like a dungeon, it doesn't, it's unfinished, but it's right underneath the router and it's a long distance from my three-year-old who thinks all computers belong to him. So I need to make sure I'm a long distance from him. So that's, uh, that's kind of what I've been doing. Um, this year, I've mostly been working on um, kind of uh, publications, trying to get some, some uh, documentation out because it's been quite tricky to, to get out there and do much research. Um, but hopefully things will kind of start to ease up this coming year. Um, so there you go, there's a bit of background about me and then uh, we can move on. This is an outline of what's gonna be involved in the presentation. Um, a little introduction, a discussion about what septic systems are, a bit on septic system maintenance, uh, something on additives, and I'll tell you why when we get there. Um, a discussion of a few of the alternative septic systems, and then a bit about maintaining your septic system during the COVID-19 pandemic. Each one of these has a, has a kind of a title slide, and I use those as a bit of a crutch to remind me to check the um, comments book box or anything like that. That. And if you've got any questions, I don't know if you've got the comments activated, but if you've got any questions, just uh, put them in the comments box or feel free to just jump in and, and ask the question straight out. Um, it's pretty easier at that point rather at the end, but if you've got something you want to hold on till the end, that's, that's fine. So on to the introduction. Um, 
Septic systems, they're, they're actually fascinating um, to someone like me who does soil science and looks at water movement in soils. And they're kind of a culmination of soil science and engineering. And it's, they're um, incredibly environment, um, environmentally conscious, um, especially your basic septic system. Um, there's very little electricity that goes into it. Everything's just running through the soil, so it's very natural. And it's, a, it's actually a very easy system, very, very clever system. However, if they are mismanaged, um, things can go terribly, terribly wrong with them. And they can be uh, expensive to repair and they could be very hazardous because I think we all know what goes down a septic system. So if that starts bubbling up at the surface, it's very bad news. Um, throughout history, uh, man has had to find ways to get rid of um, his waste. And here we've got a, this one is a, a Roman bath. So this is kind of early civilizations and they're trying to work out how you get rid of human waste, even at this point. And this is a, a bathhouse. So each one of these could be a, a little Roman man sat on it. And then in some situations they'd actually invented sewers at the time. And um, if you remove that way and in other circumstances, someone would have to come through with a shovel and, and remove it that way but it's been going on for a long while. And I had to put a picture of a castle in because I like castles. And I don't know if, if you've ever been to Europe and, and been around a castle, but there's always these big ports and you look down them and you think that's exciting. There's always a huge long drop down to the bottom. And um, as a kid, I never knew what they were. <laughs> so you just spend your whole time looking down there. And then as you get a little older, you realize that, you know, 800 years ago, someone was using that as a toilet. And uh, it was always, I found them quite interesting. And then kind of things moved on and um, we started throwing our wastewater out of windows. Um, in this instance, uh, this is York, which is close to by to where I'm from. And uh, you can see how close the streets are. And, they just be hell in the uh, wastewater out. And it brings me up to a very fascinating and interesting fact. And um, it's nice that I have you to bore with my fascinating and interesting facts at the moment, because I think my wife is getting really tired of my fascinating and interesting facts. But in Britain, we often call a toilet a loo. And it actually comes from throwing the wind, throwing wastewater out the window. Back in France, they'd say garde loo. And that eventually came to England and people just shout, guard a loo. And it ended up being a loo. So your loo is your toilet in England. And that's the reason why. That is fascinating, isn't it? I bet you're all pleased that you tuned in at six to six o'clock today for that bit of information. Um, and then we've got kind of long drop out houses, another way of kind of disposing of waste. I think this one up on the top right here, I think that's Jefferson's. It's one of the founding fathers. And then I was looking for one where Billy the Kid got shot. I think he got shot in a house. Um, but I don't think they actually have that one. But essentially, we ended up with these kind of long drop situations. And then kind of mid to late 1800s, uh, a person in France um, came along and he invented what we kind of commonly consider uh, the first septic tanks. And it's got a lot of the similarities to the septic tanks we'll see today. So we actually have a tank. Hopefully you can see my little mouse moving around. And then you've got inlets and you've got an outlet and you've got a way of removing the solid waste up there. And it, in this instance, it drains straight to the sewer. I think in a lot of instances, it'll drain straight to a stream or a river, if I had to guess. But these are kind of the early septic tanks and they do look very similar to what we have. And in the US, septic tanks were kind of taken up a lot. Um, and I think it's kind of to do with the geography of the US and uh, partly kind of the American dream where everyone wants their own bit of land. They all want to kind of be separated. In Europe, everyone's compacted together. So kind of sewage systems work, but here everyone kind of wants a bit of land and it's hard to get yourself linked up to municipal sewage. So septic tanks in the US are, or yeah, they are very popular. 
And this uh, is a design from back in the 1920s, kind of showing, you know, it, they still run along very, very similar lines to what they originally were. Um, but obviously there are big municipal waste areas now. Um, a lot of people have moved over to this as we get kind of larger cities. And this is where a lot of the waste will be dealt with. But septic tanks are uh, still very, very popular. And when we think about septic systems, a lot of times it's very easy to think that it's just toilet waste that goes into them. But there's so much more than that than actually goes into the, the septic system. We've got uh, washing machines, uh, dishwashers, grey water, and that's heading out in there. And whenever you do washing up, uh, take a bath, uh, have a shower, um, your garbage disposal goes straight to your septic system. Or if you like this gentleman here, uh, you can wash your bike in the bath and that all that waste will head off to your septic system. Your septic system's got to deal with all of this. So what is a septic system? Um, well, it's for homeowners that aren't actually attached to the municipal waste sewer system. And they use just this natural ability of a soil to filter, treat and dispose of the household waste. So it's a, it's a really, really clever and um, good idea. And uh, here's a picture of uh, somewhere in London where they had the Fatberg. I don't know if you've heard about Fatbergs, but in the, in the sewer systems, all of the grease that's sent down all tends to amalgamate. And in this, they actually had to get rid of a giant lump of fat from the uh, sewer system that was blocking everything up. So I thought it was quite a nice one. It's like the Whitechapel fat bag was defeated here in 2017. And that amused me. Um, so we'll talk about the septic tank first of all. Um, wastewater from your house goes into the septic tank and there hopefully it breaks into three separate layers. Um, at the top, we'll get the scum layer and that's made up of your oils, your greases and your fats. Those are all less dense than water. So they'll sit on the top and float. And then down at the bottom, we get the sludge layer. That's all your uh, solid material, denser than water. And that goes to the bottom. And then hopefully in the middle, you end up with this layer that is just water. I say just water, it's not obviously not just water, but it's not got the, the solids or the fats because we really, really want to keep those solids and fats out of our drain, drain line system. So we're hoping to just move the water in there. Um, and within the septic tank itself, there is natural bacteria. And that natural bacteria runs in an anaerobic situation um, because it's full of water, there's no oxygen. So we have anaerobic bacteria. And that anaerobic bacteria can actually convert about 50% of the solids in the tank into liquids and gases. So we're already getting a lot of work done before we even get to the soil just by containing, <coughs> excuse me, containing the waste within the septic tank. Um, so the main reason of having a septic tank is to remove the solids from the wastewater. If the solids make it to your drain line, then we can have all kinds of problems. Um, biological material doesn't conduct water as well as soil. So you, it tends to hold it up within the drain lines. It can also cause clogging and in the pipes and prevent water moving that way. But if it makes it to the drain lines, you don't get the water infiltrating as quickly. And so it starts backing up and then it'll start destroying your drain lines. So we really want to keep those uh, solids, uh, the heavy solids and the um, greases out of the drain field itself. And here is my diagram of a septic tank. And you may be able to tell I'm not an artist and I am not great at graphical communications, but here is a septic tank. And we've got coming from the house, we have our gray water that comes into the septic tank and it eventually builds up the septic tank. So it's all gray and that, but during, uh, over time, we actually have it settle out down to the bottom. So our solids drop down to the bottom here. This is our solid waste. 
And then up at the top here, we have our greases and fats and they just bob around on the top. Um, often we have T's in septic systems or septic tanks that prevent the water from just spraying out. We want it to kind of come into the bottom here so it doesn't stir it up as much. And quite often tanks are chambered. So this one has kind of got two chambers. And so it prevents the as much of the solids and the greases from coming through to this end and it keeps the water at this end cleaner. And you're hoping everything is kept over this side. And so from that point on when it reaches capacity, each time um, anything enters the system, something leaves the system. And that's essentially how your septic tank works. And then uh, it gets sent onto the drain field. So a little discussion about the drain field. Um, when wastewater reaches the outflow pipe, it's sent off to the drain field and then it is distributed about the drain field. We hope it gets evenly distributed around the drain field and we don't want it just overloading one drain line and we'll discuss a little bit about that in a second. And this is where our wastewater goes through its final treatment. Um, within a soil, we have um, solid space and pore space. And the pore space can be made up of water or air. And we hope within a soil that we have plenty of air. So now we're getting aerobic bacteria. So we've had anaerobic bacteria within the septic tank breaking down certain parts of the wastewater. And now it goes into the soil where we have aerobic bacteria, which breaks it down further. And we want this, the water to move slowly through that soil. We don't want it to move rapidly. We don't want um, big pores that allow it to move rapidly because then it won't get treated. So we need it to move through relatively slowly. And by the time it reaches wherever its destination happens to be, the water table, some kind of outlet, um, hopefully it's been treated enough that it is safe. So here's kind of a, a diagram of how the septic tank works. Uh, it fires it to the distribution box. And my distribution box is poorly drawn because all of these pipes should really be coming out of the distribution box. The distribution box uh, allows the wastewater to move evenly through the drain field. So it, it really should all these pipes be coming out at the same, same point. And then it gets evenly spread across the drain field like so. And here's where our soil comes in. This is kind of the important soily part. And here we have the pipe running into the gravel uh, trench, and then we have soil below it. So water comes out of the pipe and moves rapidly through the gravel because gravel has got big pores. It's not holding onto it. It's just there to kind of create a, a void space for the water to move down. And it kind of it'll start to build up on the bottom because um, soil isn't doesn't conduct water as well as gravel, so you get that kind of build up, and then gradually, over time, and this is kind of the important part, we get the water moving down through the soil, and as it's moving through that soil, it's getting picked up by the uh, aerobic bacteria that break down more and more of the. Uh, nastiness within the wastewater. So on to a bit on septic systems maintenance. And we'll start with a, a picture of a septic system failures. Um, when septic systems fail, it can often be quite obvious. You'll get a lot of odors. Sometimes you'll get um, wastewater backing up into the house. Uh, you can get ponding in the yard. Usually that ponding is pretty unpleasant. And then from that, we actually get um, improper treatment of the pathogen. So the pathogens are at the surface, surface that can cause more damage. And then you can actually get potential contamination. If you've got surface runoff of this material and it can make it somewhere, then you can have uh, a lot of problems. And this looks like it's some kind of toxic waste, but it's just a dye, just a trace of dye. But I quite like that picture, it just makes it look like septic systems have got weird toxic waste coming out of them. It's just a trace of the eye to, to work out where the leaks actually come in from. 
Um, one of the key things with your septic tank is um, to have your septic tanks pumped. And this is often overlooked and it is quite easy to overlook because a septic tank, if it's working properly, it sits in your garden and you don't really notice its existence. It's not something that you're thinking about. Or you, I hope that you're not thinking about it. I, I think about them a lot, but I don't suppose many other people think about them a lot. So they'll get kind of overlooked. And because if people do overlook them, then your tank will fill with solids and fats. And if those solids um, fill up the tank, then there's a lot more chance of them getting into your drain lines. If you're lucky, they might just uh, stop up your distribution box and kind of block that. If you're unlucky, they'll reach, it'll reach your drain lines and start moving through them. And then you've got a real problem on your hands. Um, if you're having your septic system pumped, um, make sure you use a, a licensed uh, professional with a state permit to handle the, the material itself. In Clemson, they always used to call, um, they used to call the kind of your, your handyman who's got himself a, a pump truck or something like that, call him a Billy Budweiser. So don't use your Billy Budweisers. <laughs> you want a, a proper licensed professional who's going to take off all of your septic uh, fluid and take it somewhere uh, where it can be disposed of properly rather than just dumping it in some pond somewhere. Um, you can find these uh, services online in telephone directories and the, your local health department will often have a list of them too. Um, I included a, a hyperlink and then I realized that there's no point in the hyperlink being there, but if you happen to want these slides, you can you can copy and paste the hyperlink. It's, it's a link of all um, the various pro, uh, septic system professionals in Virginia. And if you are having your septic system pumped, it's good to get estimates as with most housework, um, you'll find, you might get a fair old range on prices and be careful or make sure you know what's included in the price because sometimes they'll just come in and you'll be just paying for them to remove the actual septic um, wastewater. And in, in other instances, they'll come in and check your teas, check your baffles, maybe have a poke around at your distribution box. So there's kind of a, there's varying degrees of, of what you actually end up paying for. So it's always good to know exactly what you're getting before you actually, before you actually start paying for these things. And this chart appears in many, many things involving septic systems. Um, it's kind of your, your occupancy um, versus your septic tank size and the pumping frequency. So obviously if you've got a big tank and only one person living in the house, it'll take, you don't need it pumping for 25 years. That kind of makes sense. It's, the tank's so big, it's not actually gonna make any difference. And on the other hand, if you've got a small tank and a lot of people live in the house, it's actually gonna, um, you're gonna need, it's gonna be, need to be pumped far more frequently. And this was actually the number one um, cause for failure when we we're in South Carolina. Um, they tended to be houses that weren't um, licensed to have as many people living in them as actually there were. And so the frequency of water and solids moving into the system was too great for the system and it became overwhelmed. And that was kind of the reason why um, a lot of these systems were failing when we were down in South Carolina. Um, it's a good idea to keep on monitoring your septic system, uh, monitoring levels of your scum and solids is a good idea. There's various online um, methods of doing this. If you go online into YouTube and you can find various people doing it. And hopefully at some point we'll do a, a Virginia Tech one of these and, and uh, be able to tell people how to do it. But it generally involves poking a stick into it with some kind of marker on it. And then you can work out how deep your, your scum is and how deep your, your solids are. A lot of septic systems have got observation ports on them. So bits at the top that you can unscrew and have a look in. If they're not there, it's probably a good idea to try and work out a way of, of getting 
some kind of observation part in there. Um, and make sure you can check your baffles uh, to make sure they're not worn down. And this shouldn't need saying, but you hear a lot of stories. Uh, you should never enter a septic tank when you're checking it. Just never, ever go in a septic tank. The, the fumes are overwhelming. It's, they require kind of respirators to go into septic tanks. But you hear, you hear stories of people who deciding to go and check their own septic tanks. It's just never go, never go in your own septic tank. Um, try and control the amount of water that you use. Um, is another good method of, of um, prolonging the life of your septic system. Um, however much water you use in the house is how much water goes into your drain lines. The more water that goes into your drain lines, the more wear that they get, and the quicker it is for them to start failing. Um, so the less water that you use, the better off your septic system is. Um, and also if you're using a lot of water, it can keep on staring up, agitating the wastewater that's in, in the system. And you'll never get the uh, solids dropping out, which means that they're more likely to pass into the outlet. So that's a, a bad idea. So if you can limit the use of um, water, it can you know, prolong the life of the septic system itself. And along those lines, uh, make sure that there's no leaks in your faucets or in your toilets. It might not seem it, but just a small trickle over a long time results in a lot of water being, a lot of excess water being added to your septic tank. And try and use uh, reducing water reducing technology. So low flow toilets, water saving shower heads or water saving faucets and try and use energy and water efficient washing machines. It means that there's less water being put in them. These are all just kind of cautionary things. Um, another big thing is you've got to watch out what actually is being put down your drain line. Um, the bacteria within the septic tank are very important. Those, they are what is breaking down most of those solids. So if you harm those bacteria, then you're actually going to end up harming the system itself. So chemicals that actually do cause damage to this bacteria should really be avoided. And then by that, I'm talking uh, bleaches, uh, paints and paint thinners. They're pretty bad news if they get into your septic system and antibacterial cleaners, I mean, it's in the name antibacterial. Obviously there's a degree of um, dilution within the septic tank. The, the big things with a lot of liquid in there. So, uh, so these uh, chemicals can be diluted as they go in, but you should kind of be very careful. Don't go, don't go overboard with your bleach, try and keep it to a minimum. And also any chemical that could potentially in the long run get into groundwater or waterways after it's passed through the septic system shouldn't be put down the drain. Um, so really, really kind of caustic chemicals, keep them out of your septic tank. You don't want them getting into the, into the water works. Um, try and avoid flushing certain products down your septic down your drains, okay. So products that don't break down really don't need to be going into a septic tank. So diapers, feminine hygiene products, flushable wipes are kind of a, a bit of an issue because they are the, the flushable. But the problem is that in order for them to be a flushable wipe, it, it, they're essentially a moist wipe. In order to, for them to be moist, then they have to be a paper that can retain water. And if the paper can retain water, it doesn't really break down, whereas the standard toilet paper kind of breaks down, whereas these are designed to hold water so they don't break down nearly as easily. So flushable is a bit of a, a, bit of a tricky term. 
Um, any plastic products, plastic bags or anything like that really don't need to be down there. And try not to put any excess paper. The more solids that you're putting in there, the worse it is. All of these can result in uh, blockages, which results in uh, reduced system efficiency. Uh, try and avoid uh, putting down a lot of kitchen waste. Uh, don't pour down your, your <laughs> I was going to say chip fat. You don't really have chip fat. Um, fried chicken fat, I suppose. Don't, don't be pouring that down the drain because that can cause clogging. Um, and garbage disposal units shouldn't be used. That's, uh, um, if you're just kind of using it every once in a while, just to kind of clear what's gathered in your sink and just kind of pass that through, then uh, there's not a problem with that. But some people use them um, to get dispose of, uh, you're making a stew and you kind of, all your potato peelings, all your carrot peelings, all your celery tops, um, onion skins, everything just is constantly put down there. You end up putting a lot of solids into your system, and those solids need to be broken down, and they're in a in a state that's going to take longer to break down than most of the solids that are in there. So your bacteria spend more time working on them, and so you can kind of get this buildup of solids going on in there. So you get this accumulation of of solids, and if you keep on putting stuff like that in then someone need, with a giant kind of weed whacker thing has to come and stir it all up and break it up and hopefully get rid of it. Um, protect your drain field. Uh, heavy objects shouldn't be driven or parked on drain fields. Um, the picture is a kind of a fairly obvious reason why uh, um, in this instance, a truck's, I think it's gone through the distribution box. Um, so it, you can actually just have physical damage of the septic system itself. But you also get uh, compaction if you keep on driving heavy things or putting heavy things on uh, above your drain lines. And so if you get compaction in these upper layers, it means that when you're trying to push water out through the bottom of the uh, drain line, the air has got to escape because if water goes down, air has got to go up. And your air can't make it through the compacted layer as easily, which means that the water gets held up within the soil profile and you can start getting it backing up towards the surface. So um, we try to avoid that compaction above the, the septic drain line. And obviously you can just directly drive a truck into a distribution box. Uh, so various ways of damaging it. Um, planting near drain lines. Um, there's a, a VCE publication that's got a bunch of suggestions for what plants you can actually put um, around septic systems, and that's quite good. But it tends to be shallow rooted uh, um, plants. We don't want anything with deep roots. Any trees that go seeking water really need to stay away from, from your drain lines because as soon as they sense it, those roots go off down there. And I'm sure we've all seen what damage a root can do. It can break into almost anything. It finds a little gap and it'll work its way in. And in this instance, you've got a, a, some kind of drain pipe that's just rammed full of roots, but there's countless examples. Um, so usually you'll see a lot of um, grasses planted on top of um, septic system drain lines because the, the shallow rooting um, they're actually really good for promoting soil structure as well. So that's, that's another bonus for having grass on top of that. Um, and try and keep water away from the top of your drain, uh, your drain field. Um, this is fairly obvious. If water's on top of your drain field, that means that water isn't leaving the bottom of it because you've your uh, saturation. And it also means that anything that's coming out into your drain field is coming straight back up to the top. And so <laughs> keeping water away from your, your drain field is very important. So in, in those contexts, uh, roof drains and sump pumps need to be discharged so that they uh, flow away from your drain field and um, kind of monitor your drain field. Sometimes you'll see drain fields will sink slightly above the um, the trenches where 
the soil has kind of dropped slightly, probably entered some of the gravel and the whole system's kind of dropped a little bit. So that needs to be monitored over time. And then additives. I was writing a few um, publications on kind of homeowners, septic systems. Um, so, um, and additives came up as something that me and the VDH employer I was writing it with, it's something that kind of kept on coming up and up. So we ended up putting a section in about additives and the section about additives ended up taking about half the space. So I separated it on this talk. So um, here's a whole section on additives. Um, there's many products in the septic, in the septic world um, known as additives. Um, in this instance, I've got two natural, ad natural additives, vinegar and yeast. I did have a, a real additive product in there, but then I thought that you might think I was picking on it. So I, I removed it and put a couple of natural ones in there. And the kind of a, they're advise, advertised to do a bunch of different things um, that can kind of increase your septic tank performance, reduce how often you need it pumping, increase your bacterial populations, and they tend to be split into two separate uh, types of additives, biological and chemical. Um, your biological are usually advertised to boost microbial activity. So kind of like a kickstart for your bacteria in there. And it's usually made up of bacteria, enzymes or yeasts. And then you have your chemical products and they're usually organic or an organic chemical of some kind. And they are kind of promoted to reduce solids, unclog drain lines, uh, reduce odors, various other things. It's important to be aware of what the additive contains and any potential harm it might actually do to the system. Um, so the septic tank, as we discussed earlier, contains naturally occurring bacteria. It's, it's in there, it comes from human guts, it ends up in the, in the septic tank, more of it is produced because there's more food for it. Um, each time the system gets used, you're probably gonna add a bit more of that bacteria in there. And so adding a, kind of a, a vial full of other bacteria into your system isn't gonna make any difference. Your biological, your microbial population within that septic tank is that great that these extra that you're adding isn't really gonna make any problem, isn't gonna make any difference. So if your septic system is functioning properly, there should be no reason that a bacterial supplement is required. Um, enzymes are quite often designed or advertised to break down the scum layer. Um, now, this is kind of bad news in many ways. We want that scum layer to to stay in the tank. Uh, we want it to stay in the tank and get pumped away at some point. If you break it up and you start hacking all those bonds and the grease ends up being in the water, then the grease can move out and move into the outlet pipe and then it can make its way into the drain line. If it makes it way, its way into the drain line, it can end up coating the soil. And if it's coating the soil, then it starts to reduce the infiltration. And if it reduces infiltration, then you end up getting back up of the water. So breaking down that scum layer is not something that we want to do. We want to keep the, the scum layer there. We don't want it entering the drain field. That's the last thing we want. So it, it can have catastrophic uh, impacts if we actually get that scum layer moving into the, into the drain field field itself. And then yeasts. Uh, you saw the uh, the picture of the Fleischmann's yeast, uh, the bread yeast, and some people swear if you put that down, it'll clean up your septic tank, no problem. Um, but, but the bacteria that's actually in your tank is there to feed on the solids that are flushed into the tank. It's not there to feed on yeast. It has no interest in any yeast that you start pouring in there. It, so um, a lot of them aren't even capable of actually feeding on the yeast itself. So you end up just kind of pouring yeast into your septic tank for no great reason. But it does give me an excuse to put a picture of Marmite on there. 
And uh, if you've never had Marmite, it's a uh, it's a British delicacy. And it tastes tastes uh, it's like a, a black, really thick, ooh, really thick liquid that you put on toast. I recommend it to anyone. It's delicious. Um, when you look at it, chemicals, uh, many chemicals are quite harsh. And if they're harsh, they can end up killing the bacteria that's in the system. A uh, few examples are some, some actually contain sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid is, can actually corrode the concrete in your septic tank. So, it's, I mean, that stuff's really, really potent. And then you've got hydrogen peroxide, which can cause your soil to get dispersed which means that the water won't flow through it as easily. Um, so these are not great things to be pouring into your, into your drain lines, uh, bad news. And in, I mean, if you wanna put these things in your system, then I think by and large, they aren't gonna to do too much damage. So if it's got sulfuric acid or hydrogen peroxide, I'd, I'd avoid those two. But most of them are probably not gonna to do too much harm but never ever think that they're going to take the place of actually pumping that septic tank out. It's just, it's not going to happen. Those, the septic tank's still going to need pumping. Um, so probably not really worth putting them down your tank. Um, a little discussion now on various alternative systems, uh, because we've got uh, mostly been currently talking about um, the standard gravity fed system where everything moves down through the, through the soil. And that's the, the common one, um, the ideal one to have, I suppose, because um, it doesn't require anything extra. But there's a bunch of alternative systems. And so we'll talk about a few of those. Uh, this is a sand mound system. And this is often used where the soil at the bottom of the system isn't really suitable for conducting the amount of water that is required to conduct. And so they'll build these little mounds up on the top of the, um, on top of the drain, on top of the soil itself. And then they'll pump the water into them and then it moves through the sand and into, uh, then it can move into the uh, soil itself. Um, it doesn't have a distribution box usually. It's got a little pump tank that can just kind of pump it or kind of dose it, I suppose. Um, and the, the entire field is covered with topsoil and seeded. Um, here's a, a picture of one. You see it here, kind of quite a long one there. Um, it's got to have adequate vegetation on the top. And once again, grasses are, are the best way to, to um, put vegetation on and to prevent erosion. Stick away, stay away from the deep rooting plants and heavy traffic should be kept away from mounds. <laughs> I had a, a really good story about someone who had one of these mounds in the garden and they turned it into a little kind of motocross jump. So they had uh, motorbikes running up and down this, this, um, this very important septic uh, mound system that's going on there. So try and avoid getting anything on them. Um, this is a chamber system. This runs just like a gravel system, but you've got these plastic chambers that create a void within the soil um, that you can pump uh, the wastewater into. Um, then these are kind of popular where we have uh, in mountains, uh, quite, they end up being quite popular there where it's tricky to take a, um, a truck full of gravel up a 40% road in order to get it to your system. So these are far lighter. You can throw a bunch of these in the back of a truck and drive them up and put them in there. Um, they do have a, an element of a storage capacity to them as well. Um, they are, if you kind of, your system's backing up or you've got a lot of water in there, they can actually be become uh, almost like a secondary septic tank and hold on to water. Um, the kind of drawback is they are made of plastic. So it's, I mean, it's pretty strong stuff, but if 
you imagine a square yard of soil is about one and a half tons, um, you can imagine that you know it's got a lot of weight to support. Um, so you can get them breaking um, where there's a lot of weight on top of them. And here's an example. And there's all different kinds of designs. A lot of times they'll have kind of lateral flow um, bins that allow water to, to leave the side walls um, and the various heights and widths. Uh, drip systems are pretty good. Um, once again, um, they don't have a distribution box, they've got a little pump tank, and then you've got um, a drip system like you would with drip irrigation, I suppose. Um, it just kind of runs up and down. And these can be designed so that they supply the, excuse me, the wastewater to the field over time. Um, usually with septic systems, you'll get kind of first thing in the morning, um, there's a lot of water use and then last thing at night, there's a lot of water use. Or when people come in from work, there's a lot of water use. So there's two kind of peak or two or three peak times that can be problematic um, in order for you to get the water through your soles um, easily. But with uh, kind of a dosing system like this, it can be designed so it doses uh, periodically and it can spread it out during the day. They're actually very clever, these systems. Now you can get ones where they'll only dose when the soils are a certain moisture content. So they know that it's, if it's close to saturation, then they're not gonna actually send water in there. Um, so it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a clever, clever system. And here's a kind of an example with the dosing lines up and down or the drip lines up and down. Um, do tend to be a bit more expensive and they do take a little bit more uh, maintenance because they've got a pump rather than just gravity fed. Uh, this is an ATU aerobic treatment. These come in in many different forms, all kinds of different things with these. But essentially you're sending aerobic, you're trying to make them aerobic so air gets pumped in them, into them. So the idea is that the wastewater that's coming out of them is in better um, is cleaner than it would be in the in a usual tank. So you can usually distribute to smaller fields, um, or in some instances you can almost go straight to um, straight to a water source, depending on how long how much has been um, how clean the effluent is. Um, but they do require more maintenance, and sometimes you have to actually get a contract with them. Um, and the pumped quite often. And in this instance, like this one's just a kind of a single chamber, whereas you can get them in all kinds of different uh, makeups. So here you've got a, essentially a, sep a septic tank, and then you've got your air pump, and then you've got your settling tank, and then it moves through again, and then it gets distributed. And um, yeah, each, each one of these, it takes kind of more electricity, more power, which increases the cost of them. And you've got to be a bit more careful when you're putting grease down your, uh, your drain lines because it can cause, uh, cause more problems. Um, constructed wetlands, these are quite nice. They look like little, um, little wetland areas and Essentially, the, the run along similar lines to push the, the wastewater into the uh, little wetland area and it's allowed to and to kind of you got a microbial pop um, you've got a microbial population within your wetland that helps break down uh, the wastewater and move it through. Um, so now on to uh, you're maintaining your septic system during COVID-19. Um, there's an extension publication on that at Virginia Tech, and that came up because I was uh, we were trying to potty train my three-year-old, and all he wanted to do was just flush the chain over and over again. And I was I was explaining to him why he shouldn't be doing that, and he didn't care because he's three. And, but it kind of the idea kind of got into my head that we're all at home now. And so, you know, 
we probably need to be a little bit more aware of what we do with our septic systems. So septic systems are designed to dose fluid into the drain lines and we actually need time for the uh, wastewater to pass through the soil. And if we've got too much wastewater going in there, then this, it won't pass through the soil fast enough and then it ends up backing up. So each time that we flush the toilet, um, have a shower, a bath, use a washing machine, each one of those um, results in more water being passed into the system. So because more people are spending more time at home, it means that more fluid is being added to the system. Um, it's like, as I was saying in a little bit back, we used to have kind of the situation where first thing in the morning, or when you come in from work, those were kind of peak times. And now it's the whole day is potentially a peak time, depending on, on what's going on in your house. Um, so the best thing to do is try and spread out your water use um, during the course of the day. Um, if you have a shower in the morning, kind of give it time before you actually put your washing machine on or your dishwasher on, think about running them overnight. Um, this kind of gives the soil that little break, allows it to filter through whatever um, water it has in it at the time. And given the option, if you have a shower, it can save about a third of the water that a bath can. Um, your antibacterial hand wash that people are using is kind of in, in enough quantities, it's not good if that gets into your, your septic system because uh, it's an antibacterial and we want the bacteria. Um, your little kind of your hand sanitizers like that, that's fine. That's not going into your septic system. But your antibacterial hand wash, if, it's, if you're kind of big family, lots of hand washing going on because everyone's worried, then you can get quite a lot of the antibacterial stuff making it into your system. Um, the CDC say that using soap and water is just as good that could, because the soap actually breaks down, I think the spike, is it the spike protein on the, the COVID virus? Uh, it can actually break that off, which makes it kind of redundant. So having soap, I think it breaks down the lipids, something along those lines. Uh, so soap and water can be just as effective. You don't necessarily need to use antibacterial hand wash. Um, a lot of people are using more bleach when they go out, uh, they come back in, they want to wash the clothes because they've been out and they want to get rid of any kind of uh, potential virus. So they'll throw a bit of bleach in there. Obviously putting more and more bleach in the system causes problems. We don't want to do that. Um, the CDC, again, doesn't actually recommend using bleach. It just says to your best chances to um, wash at the highest recommended temperature for that clothing. Um, and if you are going to use bleach, um, it's probably best if you just save your kind of your big loads until, uh, or save it up for a big load. So you kind of, you, you're thinning it out, I suppose. It's not bleach every single time. Um, try flushing a little less often. <laughs> there are lots of pictures of uh, urine in toilets, but I went with this rather more uh, pleasant picture. Uh, more time at home, more people are, are using the restroom. Um, try flushing once every two or three visits. Um, I think I had a friend who always used to say, if it's yellow, let it mellow. I never like that phrase. Um, obviously, if it's excrement, uh, flush that. Don't, don't leave that just sat there in your, in your toilet. And then uh, follow your best management practices that we've discussed. Um, get your tank drunk regularly, reduce household water use, don't flush the unflushables, don't put dangerous chemicals, uh, try and use the garbage disposal a little less than usual and monitor your septic system. And um, I think with that, yeah, that brings me to the end. Um, there's my contact details. Um, I guess I can take any questions. Uh, I don't, I don't have a chat box, so I don't know if there are questions coming in or not. Okay. Uh, yeah, we we got some comments. Uh, 
let's see. Uh, so my comment, the, uh, they were fascinated by the history of the, the loo. They'd always wondered where that, <laughs> that term had come from. Uh, I'm pleased someone's fascinated about that. <laughs> But it was, it was interesting that, that, that I didn't, didn't know that. Uh, they commented that it's uh, ju just it's a little bit unnerving, a little scary of all the problems that can occur with a, with a septic system. Um, and I, I had posted a link to your most recent publication. Uh, so that's, that's in the chat box. If people want to uh, visit that, then they can follow that link. Um, Thank you very much. And... Uh, Oh, that's that's all the the questions or comments that I see. If anybody has any other other questions for Dr. Brown, uh, you can either pop them into the chat box for us or just very good that? presentation, epic. Yes, <laughs> yes, very, very good. I want clarification on if uh, if if I heard you refer to the toilet as the gin. Is that what you um, called it? Uh, the the loo we've got the loo the bog we've got many many terms for the toilet in Britain. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a about topic of the gin. So um, it may have just be my accent. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have one, so <laughs> <laughs> you're not from around here. Are you? <laughs> 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 See, in my head, everyone else has got an accent, and I don't. Yeah. I have a question. Does um, does weather conditions have any significant impact on septic systems? For example, if you're going through a really wet um, several days of intense rain and the soil is, gets extremely saturated, uh, should you be more sensitive about how much water you're putting into your system? during that time period? Yeah, ideally, yeah, you would. Um, if you've got a lot of water uh, coming down and especially if you're starting to see surface ponding, um, that means that water's not moving out of the bottom of that system particularly quickly. So you can kind of get back up. It is tricky. Um, it's tricky to use less water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but ideally, ideally you would. Kind of in those situations kind of try and pull back on the reins a little bit this is on that same vein but a lot of people around here i've seen them mound um the soil on top of the uh, the vault to try to throw some of that water uh the rainfall away from the top uh, does that matter or, or no do you get much water infiltration through that vault um, so that's uh, like a surface drainage kind of system. Uh, yeah, well, that, I mean, surface uh, drainage uh, is, is huge. Uh, surface drainage can move a lot of water away. So if, if you can kind of get some kind of slight mound on it, moving the water away using kind of surface drainage, that's, that's not a bad idea at all. <clears throat> I had a problem with my septic system a little over a year ago, a serious problem. My distribution box uh, crumbled, deteriorated to the, to the point of it just uh, collapsed. It, uh, it wasn't because of external uh, force or weight being put on it, it just failed. But uh, I spent a lot of time around a septic man during the process and and one story he told me, I thought I'd share it, it's real short. He said he'd seen everything and he went into a, a home or went to a house one day to pump their septic tank. And so he knocked on the door and he asked where the clean out was. And the guy opened the door and he said, come on in. <laughs> and so the guy led him in the house, down the hallway into the bedroom and opened up a trap door and said, here it is. And <laughs> sure enough, the, the the house was built on top of the tank. <laughs> That's the first time he had drug his hose down someone's hallway. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant, that one. I'll be using that one. 
Uh, it's stuck with me. It's quite unique. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Especially in your bedroom. <laughs> yeah, of all places. Yeah. Right, any any other questions for Dr. Brown? That wasn't your lawnmower at the end, was it? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, that wasn't the cause of my distribution box failure. <laughs> but I did think about it when I saw the picture. <laughs> well, that was very visual. That's probably the best PowerPoint I have seen of, this is like a hundred that we've done. And that has to be the best visual PowerPoint presentation that we've seen. Yes. Definitely. <laughs> well, these, these Zoom meetings are kind of tricky, aren't they? You need to have something to entertain the audience, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Dr. Brown, very, very timely, very, uh, very helpful information. So thank you very much for uh, agreeing to speak with us tonight. And, and the, the invitation to, to come to Wise County stands, if you, uh, we can schedule some site visits for you and give you a tour of this part of the state. Be, we'd, we'd love to, love to host you one day once the pandemic kind of eases up a bit. So I hope you'll come pay us a visit at some point. I'd love that. That would be great. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, fit right in. Thank well, you. Well, well, he would fit right in. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks, folks, for uh, for joining us. And uh, this will be. I, I put a link also in the the, the chat box. Uh, this will be posted on our YouTube uh, channel by tomorrow. I'll probably have it on there tonight, but at least by tomorrow, this presentation will be posted in case you need to go back and reference. Uh, something that Dr. Brown talked about. So, um, so I hope everybody has a good night and a good weekend. And uh, and again, thank you all very much. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.